Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve salatu ve salamu ala Resulü'l Kerim. Amma ba'd. Rabbi şrahi sadri ve yasirli amri. Ve ahlul nuqtatan min lisani yafqahu kavli. İnşallah today we, we are going to cover uh, Surah Al-Kafir. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this in the, in the Meccan period. In the, so this is a Mekki surah. This is a Mekki surah. Um, this was one that came as a warner. The surah was revealed as a warner. Um, this is all, also another surah that is, is, uh, is highly pertinent to the likes of us. Here living in comfort, um, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed to, to the, to, of course to the Muslims, but to all of humanity. All of humanity and the jinn. Um, but this was revealed as a wake-up call. This was revealed as a wake-up call uh, to, shake, to shake the people. To shake the people out of a slumber that they had, they had fallen into. Now, this is uh, a, almost like a state of intoxication. Uh, when, when one is drunk um, and they can't gather their senses, they can't think straight, um, and, they are, and, it's as the, and, and here what, what is described is that they are drunk, uh, not with intoxication, but rather with the intoxication of the pleasures of this world. The pleasures of this world. And, uh, and this surah, uh, it came to, to shake the people and strike, uh, strike uh, terror into their hearts and to wake them up, to sober them up to the reality of life, to the reality of life and death. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts, uh, starts with words that penetrate the heart and, so, and sober up uh, the, the one that is fixated with this dunya. And, uh, and ultimately, this is a wake-up call for everyone. It wasn't just for the believers. Of course, uh, and we'll talk about this, uh, the condition which uh, uh, this was revealed in. But inshallah, inshallah before that, I'll, I'll uh, give you a quick translation of it, and then we'll talk about exactly what is intended by this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Al-Hakumu Al-Takatur. al is uh, to, uh, to divert, to distract. To divert and distract. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Hakumu Al-Takatur. And uh, this is often uh, translated as, um, you, you, uh, you are, Al-Takatur is, uh, um, you are busy, busy in your life um, in, in mutual rivalry. Mutual rivalry meaning competing with one another, competing with one another in amassing the dunya and amassing the dunya, collecting wealth, collecting wealth. But it's, it means more than this. But inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about this. Allah subhanahu wa taala then says, "Hatta zurtumun maqabir," until you visit your graves, until you visit your graves. Kalla sofa ta'alamun. No, indeed, you will come to know. No, indeed, you will come to know. Thumma kalla sofa ta'alamun. And this is a repeat of the same ayah uh, for emphasis. This is an emphatic uh, sentence. This is to, to emphasize and to threat. This is like a threat. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kalla law ta'alamuna ilma al No, and this no kalla is a rebuke. It's a rebuke. It's a rebuke and it's, a, it's, a, it's like a shaking. Of the people that are being spoken to, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Kalla lo ta'alamuna ilm al yaqin." And if you knew uh, a, with a certainty, if you knew with a certainty, "La tarawunna al jahim," "La tarawunna al jahim," and uh, and you and you will surely know the fire. You will surely know the fire, or, or you will surely see the fire. Um, this. Uh, this, fire, this, this name, Jahim, is uh, one of the names of the fire. And we described the fire in, uh, in Surah An-Naba and many other, many other, other uh, ayat that we took. And then he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ and, and then you will definitely see it with, with, uh, with, with an eye of certainty. With an eye of certainty. عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ is an eye of certainty. It's a certain knowledge, is what is intended here. But why the word عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ? Because... Uh, uh, that which you see with your eye, uh, you're certain of. That which you see with your eye, you're certain of. ثُمَّ لَا تُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ And then you'll be asked, then you'll be asked that day about the, the pleasures. About the pleasures. Now, we said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
wakes the people up from the slumber, shakes the people. Here, um, what is intended here, as uh, Shokani mentions, Alhaqum uh, al-Takathur, ay shagalakum al-Takathur bi amwal wa awlad wa tafakhur bi kathratiha. In that, Shokani he says that uh, you've been busied up, shagalakum, your life has been busied up with, uh, with uh, mutual rivalry, uh, competing with one another in, uh, in collecting wealth, bil amwal wal awlad in your children wa tafakhur bi kathratiha and uh, and boasting and competing with one another uh, in that you're displaying your wealth and the amount of it you're displaying your wealth and the amount of it ibn jarir he mentions uh, jarir ibn jarir tabari he says al hakum ayha an nas al mubaha bi kathrat al mal wal adad an al ta'ati rabbikum allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says by this that you, uh, you boast and you flaunt your wealth. And your wealth and, you, and, and adad is like the, the number of children that you have. And, uh, and this is ultimately... Uh, he says one thing beyond what uh, Shokani says. In that he says ultimately this has led you to, to, uh, to the disobedience of Allah. Meaning taking you away from the obedience of Allah. Now, these are things uh, described to us here. These are not things which are haram. These are not things which are haram. Your, your wealth, money, amassing wealth, uh, this, is, this is permissible. Having children and lots of them is permissible. In fact, more than permissible is something which is uh, encouraged. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to have lots of children <coughs> and encouraged us uh, to seek uh, from the bounties of Allah. So these are things which are permissible. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al haakum uh, Alha, you've been diverted. You're diverted by the very fact that uh, you're, you're amassing wealth. You're amassing wealth and you're amassing children. Uh, you, you, you haven't lost children. And you boast, you boast about these things. And, uh, and you could say, uh, you could compare it to our, in order so that we can understand this, uh, you know this, this uh, bling bling culture. Like, what is this? This is uh, the whole bling bling culture. It's about uh, a display of wealth, right? It's about uh, showing your wealth uh, on your person or in your car, uh, where, where, where, whatever it is, your gadgets, the, the jewelry that people wear, the clothes that they wear. Um, all of this is that um, they, they, these are things which are not haram. You know, the wealth, the, the, the gadgets and the cars and uh, any of this, none of this is haram. But the thing is, the display of it is uh, this is what is this uh, Shokani says this tafakhur tafakhur bi kathratiha the boasting of it uh, with the amount of it that you have so the people and, and uh, one of the things we can see for example is that uh, in the in the society we live in that which we can uh, understand is that people people are buying houses they're buying cars and uh, they're buying the latest car. And uh, for their houses, they're, they're, they're going out, uh, spending all sorts of money, doing their houses up. And there's nothing wrong with any of these things. But they do it, and, uh, and they do it to compete with one another. And you see that uh, there's, it's, like a, it's like one person does, a, does their bathroom. They tell, they tell other people about it. Then the next person does it. And then they're all doing it. And they're going out, and they're, and they're spending huge amounts of money, like huge amounts of money, doing their houses up. And, uh, and they're doing it for the purpose of what? Mutual rivalry. Mutual rivalry. Is this haram? Like, the, the doing their houses, none of this is haram. But the thing is, the mutual rivalry, the competing with one another, until, what does it do? It distracts them from uh, the, their purpose. It distracts them from their purpose. They, get, they become distracted from, from uh, the obedience of Allah. And you find that uh, people, when they, when, they become, uh, when they start gathering wealth, when they start uh, gathering wealth and they're working, they start working all hours. They start working all hours. And what do they, what, what's the first thing that has to give? The thing that goes on the back shelf and uh, they say to themselves, like, uh, I'll do this when I've got some time. The first thing that happens is the Qur'an is put on the shelf. 
the Quran is put on the shelf, the, the words of Allah, the, the very thing that was revealed to us in order to guide us and to give us this huda, uh, to guide us to, to, to, the, to the path that takes us to, to the eternal paradise. The very thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to, to give us a harmonious life, uh, we put on the back shelf as we become contented with the dunya. So these things uh, that are permissible, uh, they now become impermissible. People have lots of children. Here, Ashokani ibn Jarir, and all of the Mufassirin, they mention this, children. Uh, how do cho- children, of course, like we're encouraged to have lots of children. But the thing is, the people, they start having children, and then, before you know it, they're busy in trying to provide their children with uh, all the various clubs and the different things that they're providing them with, like uh, from the material, uh, you know, all the things that people do. Like, we do, uh, I don't need to go into the detail of it, but what, what happens, uh, they become busy with serving their children. They become busy with uh, looking after their children, entertaining their children, and, uh, and, and they make this an excuse uh, for not uh, worshipping Allah. They make this an excuse for not having time. When you become diverted, ultimately, uh, you start to say that you don't have time. This is the first thing that person says. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time for this and I don't have time for that. I don't have time to study the book of Allah. I don't even have time to read the book of Allah. How many times do the people uh, say this, that they don't have time? But you see that they travel to work. Uh, from here, especially from here, you, they, people travel into London and they, they travel like maybe 45 minutes every day, both ways. So that's like an hour and a half. And, uh, and unfortunately you find that the people, they just sit there looking at their phones. They're looking at their phones, they're, they're, they're messaging their friends, uh, or they're tweeting, or Facebooking, whatever it is, but they're busy. al hakumut takathur al takathur here is their phone, or it's, another, it's something else from the dunya. Things that are not impermissible, but they are diverting us, and, uh, and the very things that we could be doing, we're not doing. And, uh, and this, is, this, is, this has become the norm. This has become the norm. Now, this surah, it was revealed uh, to the... It was a Mac, it's a Makki surah, meaning that it was revealed in the Meccan period. Uh, it was revealed, and we know that in this period, 13 years, Allah, uh, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he called, to, he called to Allah for this period of time. Now, in this period of time, the people, uh, not a huge amount of people accepted, accepted Islam. There was only a small amount of people that accepted Islam. It wasn't until they made hijrah that their numbers grew rapidly. And even then, it wasn't that, that big. In the, in the Battle of Badr, it was 300 and, uh, and, uh, and so many. 300 and so many. Like, uh, this, uh, this number was the largest number that they had, they had gained. And this only happened when they uh, reached Medina. This only happened when they reached Medina. Prior to that, for 13 years, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was calling to, to Allah. Uh, and he, it was the miracles that were coming to him. The linguistic miracle was with him. The Arabs, they understood this. And the various other miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, but still only a small number of people accepted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah to wake them up, to shake them. An example... I want, I want to give so that we can understand this um, or we can relate to this verse. You know, uh, when, you have ch- when you have children, you know, when, when you put a TV in front of a child, uh, whether it's a movie or a cartoon or whatever, but something that they're, they're, they really love, you put it in front of them and, uh, and they're watching this. What happens? The child becomes fixated with the TV. Like if you talk to the child and you call the child when they're watching their movie or their cartoon, they don't, they don't respond. You can be right next to them and you're calling them, but they don't respond. They're so fixated. They're so fixated on this cartoon. And in order uh, to, to break this fixation, what do you have to do? Like uh, the parents here, even, even those who are not parents, like uh, you know it yourself, like uh, what we did. And you know with the, the, your nieces and nephews and what they do. When they're in front of the TV, uh, you can't get their attention. 
So what do you have to do? Like you're trying to feed them. Like for myself, like uh, if, if, if I put a cartoon on, uh, on YouTube for my kids, uh, they're so fixated to it that if I want to grab their attention, sometimes I will have to, uh, even if I raise my voice, it doesn't work. I'll have to get up and block their way. I get up and I block their way and it doesn't register with them. I notice that it doesn't register with them like instantly. It takes like a couple of seconds before they realize that I'm standing in front of them, blocking their way. And then they, they're looking at me like, what? What have I done? But the thing is, you know, the, see, you know that fixation is so strong. It's so strong that you have to literally get in the way to break the fixation. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, Al-Hakum al Like, your fixation with this dunya is that strong. Your fixation with this dunya is that strong. And, uh, and these verses are sent, and all the verses that we've spoken about, especially uh, those which are revealed in the Meccan period, they're there to wake the people up, shake them. If you want to wake up a, uh, a people, a people who are in a slumber, the verses that will wake them up and that will strike terror into their hearts, those are the ones that will shake them enough to break this fixation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed this verse in the Meccan period where the Muslims were not wealthy. The Muslims were not wealthy. Their wealth was being taken from them. They were being persecuted. But the people that were refusing Islam, they were, they were the ones that were fixated with the dunya. Now, the dunya has... Uh, life has three, uh, three phases. Life has three phases. You have the first phase, uh, which is the dunya. The first phase, which is the dunya. And then the second phase is uh, uh, the grave. The second phase is the grave, and the third phase is uh, the hereafter, whether it's going to be paradise or hell. We don't have any say or any choice in any of them except the first, except the first one. So what we do here makes all the difference. It will determine uh, your second phase and your first phase. And if you remember, last week I mentioned the hadith, um, where Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was, uh, he was standing by the grave and the companions, uh, his companions, they saw him crying and they said to him, uh, they said to him, when you speak about the, the heaven or the hell, Jannah or Nar, when you speak about this, uh, you, don't, you don't have this response. You don't cry like this. But when you, when you speak about the, the grave, then, uh, <coughs> then you become overwhelmed with grief. And uh, they asked him, why? Why is this? And uh, he, radiallahu anhu, he said, Verily, I heard the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa say that indeed the grave is the first phase of the hereafter. The grave is the first phase of the hereafter. If this is easy for you, then that which comes after will be much easier. And if this is hard for you, then that which comes after will be far worse. So what did we say? We said that... This grave is like a window to the hereafter. And you, you are choosing your condition in that grave. It's not something which is going to be inflicted upon you. It's not like you've got no choice. You are choosing uh, the, the, your condition in the grave. And you are choosing, ultimately, your condition in the hereafter. And how are you choosing this? You are choosing this uh, by choosing your deeds. By choosing your deeds. You can be from the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes here. al hakumut takathur You've been dis diverted, distracted. Or you can be from the people that you choose your deeds. And we said, what do we say deeds are? We said deeds are like a signpost. Each deed, it gives you the direction to the next deed. So if you do a good deed, it makes you follow the same path until you see another good deed. And each deed will take you to the next. Whereas if you do the evil it will lead you to the next evil deed. If you do something to displease Allah, you will do something else to displease Allah. And this is the normal path. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waking up the people, trying to break, uh, break their fixation by striking terror into their hearts, telling them that you are coming back. He subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرِ 
until you visit your graves. Until you visit your graves. And this is, uh, goes back to the phases that I'm talking about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the... Uh, Allah doesn't say until you go to your graves, until you die. Allah uses the verse Zurtum. Zurtum, uh, it means to visit. You, until you visit your graves. Right? You're visiting your graves. Why? Because your grave is a temporal period. It's a period that's only for a fixed, moment, fixed time. You know the first two phases that we described, the, the dunya and the grave, only last for a fixed period of time. And then you will go to eternity. Then you will go to eternity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you won't, you won't uh, understand. For these people that are in this deep slumber, they won't understand and, until they reach the grave. Until they reach the grave. This is not just a, a statement. This is a reminder. Because look, wh why was this verse revealed? It was to wake the people up. It was to shake them. Allah's reminding them about the grave. And you know with the grave, this is something that every Muslim should do. Every Muslim uh, should go to the graveyard and, and remind themselves of their ultimate destination. That's the next phase. That's the next phase. And I know personally... Uh, I know people that have spent their entire lives avoiding uh, funerals and graveyards. Their entire lives they've avoided funerals and graveyards. And you know why? Because they fear the, the fear that will strike their hearts when they go to that grave. They fear that their eye will see the reality of uh, where they're headed. So they avoid the graves. They avoid washing the bodies of the dead. Because when you, that's a, a surreal uh, experience that you, no one can truly understand until they've done it. When you wash the, the body of a dead, one that you know, maybe of the same age as you, when you wash that body and you feel that cold, uh, it doesn't feel like uh, anything else that you've ever felt. And you know that you will become that. You will become that. And the place that that body is going, you are going to go. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta zurtum al maqabir You won't know. So for the believers, it's incumbent that uh, we make regular visits. Uh, not for the purpose of making, making, make, uh, make, uh, reading the Qur'an. Not for the purpose of uh, worship. Not for any purpose except uh, to understand where are we going. So that this, if you go there, to the grave and you do anything else but you don't come away thinking that I'm headed there myself then it defeats the purpose it defeats the purpose you have to understand that when you go to the grave uh, and you stand upon that upon that earth think about those that are underneath it and think about the fact that you are soon going to be underneath this so Allah SWT says and verily you've been diverted by your, your mutual rivalry like competing in the dunya this whole bling bling lifestyle where you're collecting the wealth and the children and you're making excuses as to why you can't obey Allah and you won't know until you go to the graves you will keep doing this until you go to the graves and you see that there are some um, especially in the society we live in. There, there are many, actually, not some. There are many that when death comes, they celebrate. They celebrate. They, they go to a funeral, and immediately, uh, in order to forget the reality of what they just saw, they, they, uh, they go and drown their sorrows. They go and drown their sorrows. They, they go and have a party... And, uh, and they call it the, a party to celebrate uh, the life of the one who's just died. Considering the fact that they're dead, uh, there's nothing really to be celebrated here. But they do it for what reason? al takathur To divert themselves, to divert themselves from the reality of that which they just saw. They just visited the <coughs> graveyard, but they divert themselves from it. They divert themselves from it and ultimately... What, what happens? They return to takathur, mutual rivalry, and they continue doing what they're doing. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala then says, 
kalla sawfa ta'lamun. And this kalla, we said this is rebuking. This is when you're, when you're, uh, when you're telling someone off. When you're, when you're shaking them, saying, wake up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, sawfa ta'lamun, and you will come to know. You will come to know. And this word, ta'lamun, it's not like, uh, uh, it, com- it comes from the word alima. Uh, to, uh, to have knowledge. To have knowledge, uh, and this is not like a uh, dhanna, uh, we, we're, we're, we're in there some doubt. Allah doesn't use any other word. Uh, this word is a, no- uh, is a word which denotes uh, uh, almost like a certain knowledge. Almost like a certain knowledge. This is knowledge that is acquired through the five senses. Knowledge that is acquired through the five senses. You see it, you feel it, you hear it, you taste it, and you smell it. So the, this is knowledge that is acquired through the five senses. It's knowledge uh, that leads you to certainty. This type of knowledge is a knowledge that leads to certainty. And then he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, repeats, ثُمَّ كَلَّ سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ and as, we, as I said already, that this is a repetition of the same uh, sentence. And this is to reassure you of the threat. Not to reassure you, to make you feel okay, but to reassure you that this is a threat. You know, uh, you know when, you, uh, when, you, when you threaten someone, you say to them, uh, if you carry on doing that, then uh, X, Y, Z is going to happen. You carry on doing that, this is, this is going to happen. And uh, especially uh, parents, parents do this with their kids. If you don't stop, then uh, you're going to get a punishment. You're gonna, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. We're going to take this away from you. Uh, and they don't listen. But when you repeat the same thing a second time with an emphasis, like really like uh, putting emphasis into your voice, they take notice. Because the second time you said it, it's like a... Um, it's like a re- reaffirming like the first time you said it and it's like pointing the finger and the second time it's like sticking the finger in the face like they're going to get it now he subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, then goes on to say kalla law ta'lamuna ilma al-yaqeen kalla law ta'lamuna ilma al-yaqeen and uh, this is a rhetorical statement this is a rhetorical uh, sentence uh, there's, Allah's not asking for uh, an answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here uh, where were you to know? Where, uh, it's, only, it's as though he subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, if only you knew uh, with a certain knowledge. If only you, you knew with uh, this truth of certainty. Because what happens? Imagine uh, you, know, uh, you know something for certain. Um, for example, uh, you know that if you touch a stove with your hand while the fire is on or it's hot, what happens? It will burn you. It will burn your skin. Now, how do you know this? You know this because uh, at some point in our lives, uh, we've actually done that. We've touched it and we've felt, we've felt the pain. This is a certain knowledge. It came through one of your senses. You felt the pain. Now, if you know that there's imminent harm by doing something, like the first time you did it and you felt the pain, maybe you burnt your hand. Thereafter, whenever you see that, you know that there's imminent harm if you were to do that action. It will lead you to not doing it. So the belief that you have in the heart that this will cause you harm will prevent your limbs from going towards it. Will prevent your limbs from going towards it. And what, what about the child? You know the child that has never felt the stone and we keep them away from it. We keep them away from it. I know my, like my son, he's always going to the stone. He's always going to the stove and I'm always pulling him away. But he doesn't get it. And he won't get it until one day, Allah forbid, that he touches it and feels the pain. And that certain knowledge comes. When that comes, then they'll never do it again. They'll never do it again. This is the difference between a knowledge which is certain. You know that. Everyone's telling you. The people that you trust are telling you this is going to harm you. But you still go towards it. Because you don't have the certain knowledge. So Allah SWT is saying that you will surely come to have that certain knowledge. You will surely come to have that certain knowledge. And then he SWT says, لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ 
you will see the fire. You will see the fire of hell. You will see the fire of hell. And this here is a, it's a, it's a finishing off from the emphatic uh, sentences uh, prior in that uh, this is the fret. This is the fret. You will come to know and you will see the fire. And uh, of course, like the other Makki Sur that we've covered, uh, for example, Surah al Naba, uh, we said uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna jahannam makana mirsada. Inna jahannam makana mirsada. Does anyone remember what this mirsada means? It's a lion way. That's right. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the jahannam as mirsada. This comes from the word rasada. Uh, which means uh, to lie in wait, watching, observing, as though you're about to ambush. As though you're about to ambush. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the fire like this. And many verses that we've taken about the fire and the description. And uh, jahim, you will see the jahim. You will see it. You will know it. You will feel it. You will feel that fire. And, uh, and this, this fire is not like the fire of the dunya, as we said. Even when we spoke about Surah Al-Buruj, we said the fire of uh, the Ashab Al-Ukhdud, that which they f- uh, faced, and the fire of uh, Jahannam uh, is totally different. What happens in the fire of Jahannam? Anyone? It's fueled by the people. It's fueled by the people. But what does it do to the people? Burn them in their conduct of love. Burn That's right. It... It takes your skin. It burns your skin. It burns your flesh until you're about to become ash. And when you're about to become ash, and normally in the dunya, what would happen? You burn your skin, you burn your flesh, and by the mercy of Allah, your soul is taken. Within minutes, your soul is taken. And, uh, and that's the end of that. Death has come and uh, has been a mercy to you, saved you from the fire. In the Jahannam, there's no death. Death only comes once, it came and it went. And this is eternity. There's no death. So when your skin burns and your flesh burns and you've been burnt to almost dust or ash, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rebuild your body, will recreate you, recreate the flesh, recreate the skin so that you could be burnt again and again and again. And every time you get to that stage where you feel that uh, it's over, uh, you'll be recreated. And you will remain in your in your uh, in your abode. Al Jahannam al Latikanat Mirsada. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that you will see this. Allah's telling this to humanity, you will see this. A wake up call, a shaking. This is what it's all about. It's about a shaking, waking the people up. And then he subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ And then you will see with an eye of certainty. With an eye of certainty, uh, meaning that uh, they will see with their eye. Uh, something that you see, with this, by saying this here, is to say, that, uh, telling them that this is something so certain as though you've seen it with your eye. And this is a threat, but this will come to be. This will come to pass. A Shokani says that the first sighting, I mentioned this in the past, I don't know if you remember, I said there's two points of certainty. What's the first point of certainty? Anyone? That's right. There's battle ahead. And the second? Resurrection. Resurrection. The first one is uh, just before you're about to die. So Shokani says that uh, the first sighting is before you enter the grave. Before you enter the grave. And the second sighting uh, will be uh, the, the day of resurrection, when, when we're raised up. Now, it is a terrifying thought that one lives their entire life. They live their entire life seeking out pleasures amassing wealth and amassing the dunya that distracts them from their, the very purpose that they were created. That distracts them from the very purpose that they were created. Now, 
missing by missing the purpose of their creation, they miss the true pleasure of this dunya. Iman. There's no pleasure in this dunya that is more, uh, more, uh, more beautiful than the, the pleasure of Iman. And, uh, and this is something that uh, you cannot gain. Every other pleasure uh, disappears. Every other pleasure disappears. You know, you get a car, you get a new car, and it, it, it's a, I don't know, it's a, a Merc, and it's, it's, you know, you take pride in your car, you love your car, and you drive it around, you're polishing it every day. But after a couple of years, what happens? You stop polishing it. You stop polishing it. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, these pleasures, they don't last. They come and they go. Every pleasure. And then, before you know it, you're looking for the next car. What's the, what's, the, what's the next car? What's the next house? What's the, you know, it's always more. You're never content. This is the state of humanity. Uh, you're never content. And by missing the, the purpose of their lives, uh, they miss uh, the fruits of Iman. The fruits of Iman. And then when it's too late, when death comes, when death comes, the, these people are in a state of absolute horror. And this is the first certainty. This is the first certainty. It's not even when, you, when you're dead. Before you're dead. When, when you're just about to be, uh, your soul's just about to be taken, uh, the, the, that soul will see uh, the angels coming to take them. And this is the first point of certainty. They saw it with Ain al-Yaqeen. In their life they see it. In their life they see it before they, they're taken. But this is too late here. This is too late here. And regret is uh, something that many people live with and, uh, and you see at the end of their life, they regret. What do they regret? They regret they, they lived according to the status quo. They lived according to the latest fashion. They, uh, they lived uh, like those who they love. They lived like those who they take as role models. And we mentioned this uh, previously, that we will be raised, we will be raised with those whom we love. We will be raised with those, who, those whom we love. So if it is the, you know, the, the I don't know, the, the, the actors or the actresses or uh, the, the sports people, or the different famous personalities that we have, all the various terrible role models that we have, if it's these people that we aspire to be like, then uh, we will be raised with these people because ultimately uh, the love of the love of these people uh, reflects in, in uh, what we know about them and how we emulate them. So if we are not emulating the, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or his companions radiallahu anhum or those righteous people who followed, if we're not emulating them, then it's not those people that we love. And I repeat this point because it's an important point. If you, you will be raised with those who you love. And remember we said... Uh, we said, uh, we mentioned that, Ibn Kathir, he mentioned that uh, the people will come and some of them will be miserable, some of them will be happy. Some of them miserable, some of them happy. And uh, the miserable are the ones heading to, to the fire. And the happy ones are the ones heading to the Jannah. Why? Because they were raised in two groups. They were raised in two groups. Forget all the different religions and all the different sects and groups. It won't exist that day. There will only be two groups. Those who believe... Those who believe and do righteous deeds. Alladina amanu wa amilu salihat. And we said this. And who are these people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described them. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَالتَّقَى Those who give, the believers who are giving, and they have taqwa. وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى And they believe in al-husna, al-islam. They will be from one group. But not if they have just the belief. Not if they have just a belief. If they have, uh, maybe, uh, they, uh, you know, they had the sadaqa bil husna. But they had the, the, the other characteristics. Man bakhila, wastaghna. They were stingy, they were miserly, they weren't giving, and they thought that they're self-sufficient. So maybe they believe, but they will be from the other party, headed towards the fire. And they will only be saved by the mercy of Allah. 
and that will be after they're purified in the fire. So regret, hatta zurtumul maqabir, regret at this point is too late. Regret at this point is too late. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes this warning saying, Thumma la tusalunna yawma idhin anin na'im. Thumma la tusalunna yawma idhin. And then uh, you be asked, you be asked that day. What day? Any idea? Al yawm al mawgood. The day which has been promised to all of humanity. La tusalun. Latus alunna yom. Latus alunna. This uh, this noon is noon of tawkid. Uh, this is uh, this uh, this is like a, this is not just a promise, but this is a, this is almost like an oath. Like uh, this will happen for certain. There's no escaping it. There's no escaping it. There's, the the return is only to one place, to Allah uh, to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The return is only to one place, the place of reckoning place of reckoning and on that day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says la tus'alunna yawma idhin 'anil na'im Allah will ask you about all of the blessings all of the blessings and the pleasures of this life that we gathered that we gathered and this this these pleasures that we we're, we're gathering um and na'im uh, is blessings is blessings so they're going to be asked about the blessings that distracted them you know, na'im, uh, from the root word comes the word ni'mah. Now, these, these blessings here, uh, you will be asked about all of them. And, uh, and ultimately, these blessings will no longer be blessings. Rather, they will be curses. It's as though the, the ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with becomes, becomes a curse. It becomes a curse. Why did it become a curse? Because al because it caused you to be diverted from the ta'atillah, uh, from obedience of Allah. An example, an example of uh, this uh, type of divergence. How are the people diverted from obedience of Allah by amassing that which is permissible? Amassing that which is permissible. An example, uh, an example we can all relate to is, uh, is uh, for example, uh, for example, uh, house, houses. We all, uh, everyone uh, strives to own their own homes. Everyone strives to own their own homes. And what do they do? Uh, this is something uh, which is permissible. This is something which is encouraged that we should have our own property, we should be self-sufficient, that we shouldn't be dependent upon others. We should have our own. But what do the people do? In, in striving to do this, uh, they disobey Allah in that they will take uh, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden for us in order to attain this. So they will take uh, interest. They will, they will take that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has proven. I mean, it's just one example. We can all relate to that. We can all relate to that. Um, everyone understands this. And, and, uh, and the reality is that what happened is that this caused us to be diverted. It caused us to be diverted. The, the, the love of the dunya, the, the love of amassing wealth, it caused us to be diverted from the obedience of Allah. This is only one example. I mean, we can all think about lots of different examples. Um, you know, uh, for example, uh, one uh, very recent example, uh, the World Cup. The World Cup, uh, during uh, specific matches, you find that uh, the people, they will delay their, their salah um, in order to watch the match. Even though they can record it. It's not something which is haram. They can record it and they can watch it. But they rather, they would prefer to delay it, delay the salah. And so they're giving precedence to what? What are they giving precedence to? You know, a brother said to me, um, a brother said to me, he was praying, uh, some match was going on, I don't even know which match it was, but he was praying the salah, 
And uh, as soon as he made Tasneem, the brother next to him pulled out his phone and he said, oh yeah, this is the score. And he started telling everyone the score. And the brother, he got annoyed. He got annoyed, why? Because he was recording it. Yeah? And he didn't want to be thinking about football in his salah. There are two reasons. One, because he's going to watch it himself. And there's nothing wrong with that. He's recording it. Second reason, because he doesn't want to be thinking about football in Salah. But you can see the brother next to him, maybe, like, Allah protect him, uh, but maybe the shaitan came and whispered to him in his Salah. And he began to think about the football and who's winning. And maybe, even maybe, when he went to sujood, he made dua that that team wins. This is a reality, but the thing is, uh, these are the different ways that uh, the dunya distracts us. These are the different ways. And ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a wake-up call. This wake-up call is for the entire humanity. It's not just for us Muslims. It's for the entire humanity. You know, uh, some, uh, a point which is related to this. People say... The, this amassing wealth, this amassing wealth, this is, you know, like, for example, uh, Allah makes things impermissible. There are things which are permissible and there are things which are impermissible. That which is impermissible, Allah does not forbid a thing except that it harms us. Either it harms me as an individual or it harms us as a community. It harms us as a community. Now, you may not even see that harm. You may not even see the harm. For example, the example we took, the riba. Like, for example, we live in a world, we just had a, a financial crisis, right? We had a financial crisis and, uh, and the whole world was affected by this. The problem with the, uh, what has caused this and why it keeps repeating itself, if you, look, if you listen to the financial analysts and read what they're saying, uh, and I've been following this, uh, you see that they're saying that all of these problems are reoccurring. Like... They, it has to happen that there's, there's, this, uh, there's this high and then there's a low. And they keep going up and they drop. They keep going up and then they drop. And uh, they have, it's like a, it's a burst. So you have, you have the dot-com uh, uh, bubble which was burst in the 90s. And then every, every so many years there's a recession. All of this is based on river. The entire financial system is based upon riba. It's based upon something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. Why? Because it harms humanity. It harms humanity. It's not, nothing is forbidden except that it harms us. Allah doesn't forbid anything for us except that it harms us. Uh, now, we can't see it. Like, you know, uh, riba, uh, interest is something that uh, is common here. And we are living in the, the 20% of the affluent uh, Population, the rest, the other eighty percent, they're the ones that feel it. They're the ones that feel it. These, uh, th with the futures and derivatives, you know, the stock market and all all of that which is going on in the stock market. When they play with futures, uh, the, the futures, uh, the, the, these are shares that basically they're gambling. They're gambling, and what are they gambling with? They're gambling with uh, food production. They're gambling with. Uh, food prices, they're gambling with people's lives and, uh, and, the, and it's all interest-based and it's, it's all interlinked but all of this, like, we don't feel it like the prices go up, we feel it a little bit but we don't really feel it the people who feel it are the people in those countries where the food is being produced and then their wealth is being taken and, and sent to the 20% of the world that consume it all this is how it works 20% of the world consume it all and 80% uh, of, the, of, of the world uh, get, get uh, the least amount. What's the result of this? This is, a, this is an imbalance in the society. What's the result of this? The result is that you have diseases that come about as a result of this. A, a, a, a, a result, uh, a disease that we can all understand is the disease of poverty and the disease of obesity. These are... Poverty leads the people to starvation, where they, and 80% and, uh, of the world, uh, where the population of, of th these countries are so impoverished that they don't even have enough food for one meal a day. 
mothers travel for miles and miles uh, to, to get clean water to feed their children, or food to feed their children, miles and miles. We don't have these problems. We don't have these problems. Now, so if we take, uh, we, we, we do things, that we do impermissible things, which harm the society, the community as a whole. We don't see the effects of this, but these people, they see it. And it affects their lives. So this gambling, this riba, all of this, and why? We're too busy in gathering and amassing wealth. We're distracted from the reality of this world. We're distracted from the reality of the three phases of life, of which only one is eternal. And this one is that which determines the rest of them. We're distracted because we're collecting from the dunya. We're collecting from the dunya. So we may, in disobedience to Allah, because we're collecting the dunya for mutual rivalry, this is all linked. We're collecting the dunya for mutual rivalry and we, we, go and get, we go and purchase a house on river. For example, the river doesn't affect me directly. It doesn't affect me directly. But the entire world system, the entire community, Allah, remember what I said, it, Allah does not forbid a thing except that it harms me as an individual or it harms the community. So that river didn't affect me. But the community, the world community, they were affected by it. And this is why this, uh, these verses were so rejected. They were so rejected by the mushrikeen the, the, uh, from, from, uh, from Quraysh and generally around the Arabian Peninsula. They rejected it. Why? Because it meant that they would have to change. It meant that there would have to be reform. Why do the people refuse it today? Why don't they want the people to understand Islam? Why don't they want these verses to be understood by humanity? The creator who sent these verses to guide humanity uh, sent it for that purpose. And these people, they don't want uh, this message to be understood. So they defame it. They lie about it. They spread propaganda and lies about it. They talk about all sorts of things. They talk about deficiencies in, in the Muslims uh, that exist. Some of these deficiencies, deficiencies exist. But... These are not deficiencies in Islam. For the one who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon Islam does not have these deficiencies because they work to get rid of them. So ultimately everything goes back to al haqum al takathur They rejected the message, the message of Allah and we said this previously. Remember I said that um, they rejected, we mentioned this in Surah al Naba. They rejected uh, the message. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, said Amma What are they asking about? They rejected for three reasons. We said that the first one was that was uh, Allah. Was Allah. Uh, they didn't have a problem with Allah. They didn't have a problem with Allah. But what they did have was that a problem with getting rid of all the other gods. Because what happens if you get rid of all the other gods? What happens is that they feared that the tribes and the people from the surrounding nations, uh, surrounding uh, Arabian Peninsula, they will stop coming because these people would come uh, to worship their, uh, their gods in the Kaaba. They would come and they would worship their gods. If they said to these people that there's only going to be one god, Allah, who you accept anyway, but you take as a second god, this demigod or whatever it is, if they, if they said this, then what would happen is that they feared that it would have an effect on their wealth. They feared that it would have an effect on their wealth. And ultimately, what is it? al hakum al takathur They feared that the amassing of their wealth will be affected by worshipping this, uh, this god alone. And the second thing was, of course, the Messenger of Allah. The Messenger of Allah... Uh, they, they, they, he was known as Al Amin. He was known as the trustworthy one. He was known. They, they, he, they would leave their wealth with him. That which they loved the most, the thing that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is talking about here. They would take that and leave it with the Messenger of Allah, but they still didn't accept the message. They still didn't accept the message. Because ultimately, it meant reform. It meant this means they have to change. And why am I saying this to you? Because this means that we have to change. This means that we have to change. We can't be from these people. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a wake-up call with these verses. By the very fact that we're here, and we're listening to this, whether we're here or we're listening to it online, wherever it is, by the very fact that we're listening to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a wake-up call. Understand, don't be from the people of, uh, of, that are being described here. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us. It's a wake-up call, it's to penetrate the heart, it's to, it's, to, it's to break that fixation. Remember I said, the child who's watching the TV, you have to literally get in front of them to break the fixation. You're calling them, calling them, calling them. They're not hearing it. When you block their view, then you've broken that fixation. And here, these verses are sent to block your view. They're, they're, they're to block your view and to stop you from looking at the glory of the dunya. Wake up, is what is being said to us. And inshallah we'll end there. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdika. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu alayka.